thank you, Giovanna. Thank you, and thank you, Lucinda, um, who is uh, I'm not sure if she's still uh, in 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 the um, Zoom call, but she is. Uh, she Lucinda and Giovanna are the uh, are, are the technical um, organizers. So I'm very grateful to them for their help and support. Uh, welcome, everyone. As uh, Giovanna mentioned, I, my name is Luca Somiglia. I am the chair of the Department of Italian Studies and um, Gojo uh, Chair in Italian Studies. So the Gojo Chair is one of the co-sponsors of this uh, of this talk. But uh, more importantly, I'm one of the members of the um, Toronto Italian Comics uh, uh, Study uh, Group, which we uh started last year with some of the people who are here on uh on this uh in this uh, uh, virtual space uh specifically I see Alessio Aletta and uh Manuela Di Franco uh, I think Gianmarco Bocchi is here somewhere as well um and the uh this little sort of group that we formed last year aims to um contribute to the uh, reconstruction of the uh, history of Italian comics um, to uh, uh, open up a space where we can discuss uh, uh, the medium uh, from a variety of perspectives, um, specifically, as I said, in relation to uh, its Italian context. I think there's a lot that still needs to be done um, in that in that field, and we are very happy, uh, uh, you know, to be able to contribute to that conversation. Um, the being able to reach out to the uh, um, large but scattered community of uh, scholars interested in uh, comics, Italian or otherwise. It's it's a large community, but hard to reach. So I'm grateful that if we, at least the one. Um, uh, silver lining of the pandemic was that it has taught us that um, uh, we can do a lot of virtual events all, um, and that they are as effective, um, uh, if not more effective, than traditional uh, conferences and lectures to connect people uh, that live uh, and, you know, scattered in the four corners of, uh, uh, of the world. Uh, this is a good example of that because um, Inge is uh, Inge, Professor Inge Lancelot is uh, uh, reaching us from uh, from Antwerp. Um, I am very happy to be able to welcome, if only virtually, um, Inge to the University of Toronto. Uh, not least because I've known Inge for a long time. We have a lot of interests in common. We comics, but also uh, detective fiction, genre fiction. Um, and uh, um, so it, I'm, I'm very uh, uh, glad to be able to welcome Inga, not just as, because she's a colleague, but also because she uh, she's a friend. And uh, so I'll, I'll just say uh, uh, briefly uh, a few words of introduction. Um, Inga Lancelot is Associate Professor of Italian Culture at the Research Unit of Translation Studies at campus Antwerp, she teaches Italian culture and translation, and she is also currently the vice campus dean of research. After obtaining her degree or uh, of licentiate in Romance uh, philology, excuse me, and her certificate in Italian studies at the University of Antwerp, she was granted a PhD fellowship by the Research Foundation Flanders. In 1998, she obtained her PhD with a dissertation entitled. Your L'orologi molli, la narrativa italiana contemporanea e la conoscenza del tempo, uh, which provided a close reading of the works of contemporary Italian authors who problematize time at both a content and a nar narratological level. Uh, Inge's exclusive focus on literature has gradually broadened to other genres or types of narratives, such as comics or graphic novels, as you wish, uh, documentary uh, film. A narrative film, street art, and so on. Since 2010, her research focuses mainly on the representation of cultural memory in contemporary narratives, such as anti-mafia, anti migration, 1968, 
and Italy's years of lead, and the uh, infamous uh, Genoa 2001 um, events. Along with Anne van Hecke, she supervises the XDOCS project dedicated to the representational migration from Latin America to the United States in, doc in documentaries that turn documentary filmmakers into new storytellers on border crossing. Finally, uh, as you can gather, Inga is a very, uh, very active uh, scholar and researcher, and among her many activities, she is co-editor-in-chief of the journal Incontri, Rivista Europea di Studi Italiani, and the editor of the Moving Text Testimobili series published by uh, uh, Peter Lang. The title of her talk today is Lost on the Margins of Literature, Comics, and uh, Graphics Novels. So with no further ado, uh, Inge Lanslaus. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Somili or Luca, for this very kind and long introduction. Uh, you just kind of set the bar qu quite high. Um, thank you so much for being here um, this morning or this afternoon. Um, I hope I will be able to give you some food for thought before lunch or dinner. Um, and I will allow you to pick my brain for about an hour. I'm going to share my findings, but also my doubts and the way uh, the process I went through to get to study um, comics. First of all, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. I'm sorry, I belong to a generation that is not used to do all those things simultaneously. Uh, can you see my screen? Okay. Um, as you might know, every um, speaker comes with an instruction manual. manual. I tend <laughs> to digress sometimes. So I will always bring you back to the um, presentation. But... If something's not clear, just let me know even during the presentation. Okay, so this was my summary. Here's the outline of my uh, talk today. Um, I'm first going to explain the title of my talk. I'm going to um, discuss briefly the status of comics and graphic novels Amongst the wider audience, I will talk about the way I relate to comics within my teaching and my research. And I want to focus on the representation of migration, othering, and multilingualism in graphics, uh, graphic novels and comics. And briefly, uh, the representation of holo the Holocaust in relation to intermediality and haptics. Another disclaimer, I might have included um, comics and graphic novels, which are not Italian, but they will show you how I got through the study of the representation of uh, comics uh, uh, within the Italian context. And before I really start, I would also like to th uh, thank Monica Janssen. It was because of the infamous Giotto, Genova, 2001, that we started studying the representation of um, the death of Carlo Giuliani in several media, among which uh, also uh, graphic novels. Um, now, nowadays, comics and graphic novels seem to relive a renaissance, and they seem to have a certain degree of respectability within society. Whereas the study of comics is usually somewhere in the margins of programs, literary programs or other programs as ones on Italian studies. I drew inspiration from, for my title from Marjorie Ellison's article, Not Lost in the Margins, Gender and Identity in Graphic Text, and Not is, within, uh, is Between Brackets. That's a 2014 uh, publication. She focuses on the representation of... Um, women and identity in some graphic novels. But what she says in her introduction is really interesting. Of course, she kind of uh, bundles the findings of other scholars. Graphic novels and comics have become popular because of the relationship between word and images or word and pictures. And for the scholars amongst us, I think studies the 
graphic essays written by Scott McLeod are very well known. At the beginning, they were kind of uh, marginal as well. Now they are the center of um, studies of comics. For those who are not familiar with um, Scott McLeod, Scott McLeod is a uh, comic writer, but he's also an essayist. He has a marvelous website. I will provide the um, PowerPoint afterwards, and there are links to his website. So he has written on graphic novels in a graphic novel style and comics as well. So why are comics and graphic novels so popular? Because of that relationship between word and images. And he defines a set of relationships which are quite useful to study um, graphic novels. But the other aspect of graphic novels and comics, which is really important, is the sequentiality. Uh, when we read a story, we don't see every sequence. Actually, the comics and graphic novels do not present a fluid story as we see in social media with all those fluid images as we see in films or documentaries. We as readers are involved and we have to fill in the blanks which are not represented, um, the blanks between the se sequences, so the blanks or the blacks left in the margins of um, the images. Therefore, we as a reader also determine the rhythm of the story and the storytelling, so we can slow down um, a narrative, or as younger readers often do, they... Um, They stop reading and they start reading later on. So it's not so that you have to continue reading all the time, whereas a film is usually something you keep on uh, watching. Now, what has struck me is that, and of course I'm not the only one, that comics and mainly graphic novels tend to uh, present, re uh, represent uh, reality and even very difficult topics, but they can do that in an abstract way in a realistic way, or even in um, within a horror setting, as we will discover later on. So there is, there is this mediation of reality. Mediation first uh, undertaken by the writer, but, but then we, have, as readers, of course, have to um, continue that um, mediation. And therefore, a graphic novels can be very useful within a teaching context. We just had a presentation at a workshop for um, teachers and they like to use graphic novels because just because they can address difficult topics, but in a mediated way. You don't so always show the harsh, harsh images as we can see in documentaries. And young readers can come to terms with those difficult topics through um, the reading of a graphic novel. For those interested, there is a very interesting graphic essay by Laura Findlay and Dominiac. The name of the illustrator is hidden within the presentation, within that pink circle. That might be one of the first digression, the position of the names of authors and illustrators is quite debatable within um, comics and um, graphic novels. It also depends on editorial policies or cultural traditions. In some countries, illustrator comes first, but that's often not the case. And that says a lot about the role of those two authors, if there are two or more authors. It's a debate very similar to the debate um, of the position of a trend, the name of a translator um, on books. Now, I don't think it comes as, as a surprise, but graphic novels and comics can give readers an immersive experience. And I think the quote summarizes what I've been telling so far, but it also evokes a lot of senses. We usually see comics and graphic novels as a visual genre because of the presence of images, but it evokes the other senses senses. We can feel things, even smell things, of course not literally, but the narratives can um, awaken other sense, uh, senses. I think it's very important to uh, underline, underpin that aspect of um, 
sorry, I went too far off uh, comics and graphic novels. Now, I've been talking about comics and graphic novels in kind of very indistinct way. And one of the main problems I've faced is the definition. How do we define graphic novels and comics? I'm not going to dwell on this, but uh, Jan Bartes, which is, is one of the main scholars on uh, comics and graphic novels in Belgium, gives us, along with Hugo Fry, a prototypical definition, which we can then adapt to the context we study. Graphic novels tend to uh, represent serious um, topics, whereas comics are supposed to entertain, but that's a distinction that often is not that clear. Graphic novels address adults, so the target audience might be adults, but I would say that younger readers, readers like teenagers, are equally able to read those um, graphic novels, and even younger children. But then, of course, I need the guidance of um, an adult, which is often the case uh, with graphic novels on the Holocaust. And I'm anticipating what I'm going to tell later on. A lot of graphic novels are used in the classroom. And the uh, authors are invited in the classes in order to test, uh, to explain the genesis of their work. And it seems that they're becoming testimonies uh, as well. So they take the role of a Primo Levi or a Liliana Segre in the classroom. Now, uh, graphic novels are easier to recognize because they have a specific graphic style, whereas comics tend to have a more generalized style. Just think of the French tradition, Belgian tradition, etc. Graphic novels are supposedly published in book format, but with the web version, ebooks, that is even um, very difficult to maintain. Graphic novels often are written by one author, complete authorship, but I've discovered so many cases in which that is not true. We have a collaboration between several authors, so instead of talking about complete authorship, one should talk about collaborative um, authorship, as Mahina Matt has stated in other um, contexts. Graphic novels are not supposed to be serial, but Corto Maltese is considered to be a, a series of graphic novels. The writer himself might have seen it differently, but the seriality is another debatable um, feature. And then, of course, there is the case of the distribution. A long time ago, when I was young, graphic novels were only to be found in specialized bookshops. But now you can find them everywhere. But they still have that label of um, being not that easy to find, maybe only for older generations. Okay, so let's move on to um, the first uh, research line, the study of migration, othering, and multilingualism in graphic novels. Uh, I've included one Italian comic to which I will return later on. But how did an Italianist start uh, studying the representation of migration along the Mexican-U.S. border? It's not a difficult to explain. I tend to collaborate a lot with other colleagues and this, while discussing with Anne van Ecke, I, I found out that we have an uh, interest in coming, the representation of migration in literature, in documentaries, in films. And that's how we uh, started a project which got funded. And along with um, Alexandra Sanchez, we studied a lot of documentaries. But in the sidelines, I decided to also study graphic novels because I thought it was an interesting countercorpus just to confront my findings on documentaries and films to um, the ones on graphic novels and comics. And there are some striking differences, which I will explain later on. Now, before addressing those graphic narratives, and that might be the general term to define comics and um, 
graphic novels. Well, Eisner says a graphic narrative is a narrative that combines word and image. And then, of course, everybody starts saying, well, film is also a combination of word and image. The sound is there um, via audio. In graphic uh, narratives, we do find uh, sounds via um, words, onomatopoeia, or um, the drawing. If you want to draw an explosion, you can write boom, or you can draw the explosion, exploding building, for example. So I'm going to try to tick some boxes. What do we understand by border? What are its specific uh, features? And then I will um, present some of my findings. Because I believe, firmly believe that um, graphic narratives construe um, meaning making in collaboration with the reader. Because of the combination of word, image, and sound. But as I said before, sound is there in a very interesting way. Now, when we think of the US-Mexican border, we often think of this, the wall. It's one of the first images that comes to mind, even if we know that the border doesn't always look like that. With the image of the wall, we often uh, get a feeling of displacement and a troubled connection to, to roots. I'm not going to explain um, why the current border is where it is. There's a long story, long history, which I had to study in a, along with my colleague, because in documentaries, um, filmmakers often highlight the moving border. In 1848, it moved to the current uh, position. Now, in documentaries, um, we not only see the wall, but the wall turns into a kind of canvas. You see here an artwork, a little child watching the border control. In documentaries, that's often highlighted, along with the fact that the wall changes size and the wall isn't that good of a border because it allows people to cross it in, a legal, in an illegal way. And sometimes the wall is not on the border because of the presence of water or other nat nat nature elements. Here you see a gate opening uh, that is being opened by the owner of that um, property. Now, as I said, the wall, the wall is often represented as a canvas, or it even becomes the canvas for um, a doctoral dissertation. It's an interactive wall. You see the one on the right. And if you watch the documentaries, you often see that the artworks are situated mostly on the Mexican side. I don't have to explain, I think, why, because people allow it, whereas in, on the other side, it's more difficult to have that kind of art or to organize performative events, to create memory sites. Um, the wall here is no longer a defense line, but is a site for grassroots artists and citizens in order to perform positive activism. Now, within documentaries, the wall is never just a line, a frontier, but it becomes a zone. And you see the gray area on the, um, on the slides. And mind the use of the words in English and in Spanish, frontera covers all the layers I've just mentioned. <coughs> I'm going to skip a few slides because otherwise I might not be able to finish. That's another uh, 
of my defects, I tend to prepare too much and then become too chaotic in my presentation. But I think a lot of scholars have the same problem. So if you look at the wall, um, it's becoming more and more complex and we have to study all its specificities. So when I was preparing the, um, the research, along with my colleagues, I discovered that, that we had to face or that we had to read um, essays within border studies, social geography. Edward Soya is a very interesting scholar in that respect. We had to study um, Latinx uh, publications, which before were uh, called Chicano studies, but that word is no longer um, accepted, except by some of the Chicano writers. We had a um, long talks with Theo Dan on post-colonial studies. We had other talks with visual cultural scholars. And of course, we um, looked into documentary studies and translation studies because what has become clear is that migration mobility, memory and memory making are at the center of our research. It might seem very complex, but I'm willing to go into that in the discussion. Now, before we uh, discuss some of the um, graphic novels, I would like to present the social actors which are present in documentaries, but not always in graphic novels. So we have migrants moving across the border in order to get to other place places. We have settlers. We have permanent residents. Commuters as well. And then, of course, we have people um, who live in one culture, um, who try to defend the border, or others who embrace um, more cultures and therefore are also called biculturalists or binationalists as well. Now, all those labels are there to identify um, social actors, but I think it's also too important that they establish a a set of relationships, a set of um, power relations, which we've discussed in an edited volume on the right. I'm going to skip this one as well. So as for those power relationships, we have political power, we have people um, who suffer because they are illegal or undocumented, with people who no longer have a sense of belonging, and we have other relationships which are social, determined from a social economic, economic point of view. We have cultural historical uh, traditions which come into play, and of course, a lot of psychological um, issues. In documentaries, what is often neglected is the linguistic part. How do people face uh, multilingualism or the use of one dominant language? The creative aspect is often there. As I showed you, those artworks are often shown in documentaries. Now, what is more central in graphic narrative is that we don't see all those, let's go back to this one, all those social actors, but usually see the migrants and uh, law enforcement, the coyote, the which is the guy that brings people um, to the other side in an illegal way, or people on the American side who try to help them. So people providing water, clothes, etc., risking a lot because it's illegal to do so in, in the States. Okay. If you study the representation of the uh, Latin American border, you can study these works. I've mainly focused on texts which are available in Spanish, but of course there's a large production um, across the border. I've started to look into that production. I don't speak Spanish very well, but I can read it. So my passive knowledge of Spanish is quite okay. And I've discovered a lot of science fiction stories 
on migration. So science fiction seems to be a good genre to um, discuss to address the topic of uh, migration. I'm just going to highlight uh, Dreamland, which is a very, um, it's a stunning text, a stunning narrative, example of um, graphic journalism in which words and images don't seem to be related. But as a reader, we are forced to connect them. So they seem to present at first uh, sight parallel stories. <coughs> Now, as for this one, Undocumented, it's somewhere in between a graphic novel and a book for children, and it unfolds like a Mesoamerican codex, like a harmonica. So it reads in a different way. It gives us a different uh, reading experience, and we, of course, have to establish a, a different trajectory. We, and with we, I intend people who are used to read Western comics and graphic novels. We start uh, at the top left, and then we go down to the right. Now, this, this is the corpus which I've studied quite extensively. And I want to highlight uh, Migrantes versus Sueño Americano, which is a publication in English, but with a partially um, Spanish title by Bianchini and Balati. Bianchini is a journalist who went undercover as a migrant and he undertook the journey. He took the Bestia, that, that's the freight train that crosses the Mexican uh, US border. It's a really interesting um, narrative because, of course, we see the representation of the journey, but it's accompanied by Lemata. So, the journalist expands on some of the topics. So far, I haven't found a translation into English, but that was the Italian voice within my corpus. I'm not going to elaborate on all the um, graphic novels, but what you can't experience on the slides is the haptics, which I talked about earlier on, in ruins, on the cover of Ruins and the Arrival, we have an excavated part. So the title is kind of excavated, you feel another layer. And the same thing happens in the Arrival. The photo is framed. It's, ex it's on a lower level, it's framed by the rest of the cover. And I will get back to that because it helps characters to root themselves again. Now, what did I study? It's, is the wall that present in those graphic narratives or are there other types of uh, representations? Does the border become a border zone? How do we cross it from south to north or from north to south? How do people, how do characters cross it? And of course, which type of visuals do they use? Now, this is the Migrante story I just talked about. I'm sorry about the quality, but sometimes scanners do not collaborate and books do not always fold as well as we want to. But here we see that classic image of the border, which is lacking in most of the other texts I've studied. So Bianchini and Balati tap into our expectations. And of course, migrants have to cross that border. Uh, in Red Border, which is more of a comic, we do see the smaller wall, which is easily we can which can be easily crossed, and we see it from different perspective. Of course, that red um, circle, orange circle, wasn't in the original, so we have different perspectives. Like uh, in films, in order to study comics and graphic novels, you do need a lot of. Uh, baggage from cinema because of all the camera standpoints. It's an easy way to... Um, I'm still here. Just allow me to get up because the lights get off automatically in our office. I'm sorry about that, but technology isn't always what you expect it uh, to be. 
The wall is also present in other uh, shapes, like a fence. You have different types of fencing, which then divides the spaces represented within the images. On the left, the fence um, is a preview of the border crossing, whereas in, on the right, the fence um, creates a divide between people who are documented and undocumented children. Manuelito is, by the way, a text which is published in Canada. It's available in English and in Spanish. Now, the border can also, or the crossing of the border can also uh, be represented via maps or other markers. And I've just shown here, um, this is very common. You see crossing the crossing of the border via land or, or via wetbacks. But sometimes it's just signposted as it is in the left image. And you see three migrants on their way and they mimic a road sign, which of course becomes very ambiguous because that road sign cautions you, whereas here it says that people are crossing uh, the border. So it's, the road sign is, has been given a, a twist in this um, image. On the right, you don't see the border. The border is somewhere, so it's kind of indefinite. This is a horror story based on Luis Alberto Brea's The Devil's Highway, a journalist who documented um, how migrants got lost in the desert and then got fined. Here you see a similar experience. People um, during their journey, journey um, because of the fatigue, sometimes get visions or hallucinate. Fundamental in uh, the graphic novels is a crossing of the border. This is a very short narrative taken from Tales from La Vida, in which you can find one page or two page narratives. Um, mind, if you can read, I hope you can read the multilingualism or the use of Spanglish within this text. Spaces are indicated in a very abstract way, and then the border crossing becomes. Um, more real. In, this, in these pages, you see a family, a Mexican family, crossing the border legally. They live in the States and they've just been to Mexico, but they still fear the crossing of the border. And it's being explained by a very interesting combination interaction between words and images. And of course, the representation of the characters is quite. You see the author zooms in to details and then turns to animals in order to represent some of the characters. Mind also the different fonts, which are um, represent signposts, different volumes. Now, the same border crossing is also uh, represented in Runes by Peter Cooper. And as soon as we cross the border, colors or the color schemes uh, change. In the States, we have blue, a blue-gray um, background, whereas in Mexico, we have more bright colors. This is a story of two Americans who take a sabbatical in Mexico. Whereas, and during their um, stay, we follow the journey of a monarch butterfly, one that takes the um, journey to the States. And whereas the monarch butterfly is orange, we see the blue, well, we see different uh, places in the States which signpost um, the work of braceros. Um, we see all kinds of um, disasters being represented. So migration is there, but in a very subtle way and at two levels. 
Now, in The Arrival, which is a wordless novel, except for the title, which in most languages translates as The Arrival, except for the Spanish edition, where we have emigrantes, and I will come back to the importance of that. In French, we have There Where Our Fathers Go, and I think in German it's something similar, but in that wordless novel, we arrive at a setting which seems New York, but it's kind of fantastic interpretation or representation of New York. Well, we only find immigrants and no one speaks the same language and everyone has to communicate. Now, this is the interview at Ellis Island or what we think is Ellis Island. And you're in the, um, during the graphic novel, you will find other attempts to communicate and we see letters, symbols, which are familiar and unfamiliar at the same time because the author, um, Sean Tan, has distorted existing alphabets. So he wants to mimic the unsettlement that um, migrants, immigrants have when they come to a place and while they don't speak the language of that um, particular setting. So summarizing, the border is there, but the wall is often missing. It's being replaced by lines and fences. We see the border zone, we see the crossings, and we see the use of maps and other signs or symbols. Now, all those graphic novel, novels seem to address agency and the positionality of migrants, which can be defined in the following terms. I've highlighted some of the um, most important um, features. I'm going to skip this one as well because I want to address um, identity and the sense of in-betweenness and multilingualism. Now, while studying my corpus, I've discovered that less recent graphic narratives highlight the feeling of in-betweenness or in interstitiality. Whereas more recent um, graphic narratives tend to embrace the belonging to different cultures. So they don't see the divide between uh, two cultures. So they highlight the positive and the negative aspects of both cultures. On the right, you see the same character, and two, which seems to have two heads. But of course, that is a representation of that in positive interpretation of in-betweenness. Therefore, characters in more recent graphic novels seem to be uprooted. They combine all the roots they've created in this different settings they uh, have lived in. And they use symbols or they resort to um, an icon iconography which belongs to the past, so they use symbols Mesoamerican symbols. You can find uh, the Virgin over there. <laughs> but often those symbols or symbols of the uh, elements of the past are given a twist. La Malinche and Cortes, the conquistador, is often present in, um, in the narratives. But he's, he, has, he has given a different role. So within those graphic narratives, we witness a decolonization. And I should have read this um, quote as well. There is a decolonization. The characters represented carry different cultures. The way the main character in the arrival carries, carries a a suitcase in which he finds all souvenirs. Of course, that's not a re realistic represent representation of his memories, but instead, in, instead of having a turtle as Anzaldúa had, this character seems to have a, a suitcase that represents 
is uh, is roots. Okay, and before going to the switching to the representation of the Holocaust, I might just finish with um, the effect um, these types of narratives have on a reader. This is very well represented in Runes, in which one of the main characters, an entomologist, at the beginning of the story just watches bugs and all types of insects, takes photos of them, but gradually becomes aware of the reality he lives in. So all those graphic, or most of the graphic nar narratives raise awareness, and they involve us as a reader. I don't think they always appeal to activism, but at least they raise uh, awareness. <coughs> Runes, by the way, is based on a more biographic narrative Oaxaca. This is a story of the sabbatical of the author himself. There are a lot of dissimilarities, but this is one of the other digressions for which I warned you. Um, I think I said most of these uh, features, it's kind of a summary of what I've said. I think I've ne neglected during my presentation the importance of othering. Othering is the way people treat other people in this, um, thinking that they are superior. So othering implies that you always discriminate the other. <coughs> Graphic narratives seem to discuss this and make us reflect on how our relationship is to the other. So the different relationships I listed at the beginning of my presentation are being discussed in the graphic novels. And as a teacher or as a scholar, one can use those pages in order to <coughs> study the taboos or the difficult topics we still have to address in society. Uh, I've talked a lot about the images, figures, of course, there were a lot of words present except for the arrival. Uh, in the graphic novels in, written in English, I did find some Spanish. And the use of Spanish or another language established different types of power relationships. So that re reflection on power relationships um, is also made on a verbal level. The, officially, we don't have any more funding for that Exodux project, but I will continue research on it. And what I have to study more are the following uh, features, autobiogra autobiographical references, color schemes, other techniques, the presence of hypotext and intertext, the importance of paratext, I think comics, Italian comics and graphic novels are very exceptional in that respect. In most um, graphic novels, we do find introductions or we find introductions or texts um, which explain or um, contextualize the story. That's not always the case uh, for other graphic novels. We have to study um, we also have to study the intermediality in a more um, detailed way. I'm going to skip this as well. I just wanted to say that I want to compare graphic novels to cartoons and the artwork along the border. Just want to draw your attention to the image on the right, which is an image drawn from La Cicatrice. It's another graphic novel on the crossing of the border. And it's a collection of stories made by people present in that border zone, migrants as well as social workers. And I think it has been a very long way before we got back to Europe again. I just want to highlight Illegal, which has also been translated into uh, Italian. And we see a lot of the features which have been um, which I've discussed briefly 
in the previous parts, use of maps, use of different color schemes in order to situate the stories in different settings. Main story is about a boy in the... Um, afterward, we will find a very short graphic narrative on a migrant woman. And that's another thing we should take into account. There are not enough think stories on female migrants. Now, I'm just going to switch to the other um, research line in which I'm interested, the representation of Holocaust and the use of different media within the graphic narratives and the senses evoked by those graphic narratives. This is, again, not an Italian um, production, but it has been translated in a lot of languages. We all are familiar with the diary of Anna Frank, and it often uh, confronts us for the first time with um, the Holocaust. Meanwhile, there is a second graphic narrative. The first one was based on the diary. The second one is written by um, the director, Ari Fulman, who also uh, turned the graphic narrative into an animation film. What do we see in this graphic narrative? Um, due to a storm, here you see it, Achterhuis of Anne Frank, um, where she did hide for a long time. Lightning strikes a house and the diary of Anne Frank comes to life, along with Kitty, the addressee of Anne Frank's diary. On the page on the right, we are confronted with migrants who uh, cross Amsterdam. And those two stories intertwine. Kitty, who seems to live a new life, who also becomes, uh, who meets a young guy and falls in love. But then, of course, the owners of the museum are not, not that pleased because tourists will not come if the diary is missing. And at the end, she has to compromise. She has to go back to, sorry, spoiler alert. She has to go back to the museum uh, and in exchange, she gets uh, housing for the migrants I've just shown you. Now, in that graphic narrative, we see a very interesting use of photographs. Most of the time, we see a transposition. We don't see a copy of the photographs, but a transposition. And that, of course, is another step in the mediation between young readers and difficult topics. Or we see the mediation of very iconographic images. When we think of the Holocaust, we think of trains going to the different camps. Okay, we're just going to skip this. And for the last two years, I've been exploring graphic narratives with another colleague, Nathalie Dupre, who's also an Italianist. And we have a funded project on... <clears throat> Jewish authors write in Italian or authors with Italian roots, but again, we like to do other things outside or inside the project. And we've been studying three biographies of Primo Levi. They're not represented in chronological orders. Carnera, Pietro's Carnera's uh, Una Stella Tranquilla is the oldest, goes back to. <coughs> I'm sorry, um, the air, air is really dry in here and I start coughing. So the oldest volume is, or the more, less recent one, is Pietro Scarnera's Una Stella Tranquilla. It was published in 2013. Primo Levi on the right by Master Agostini and Rangiashi was published in 2017. Una Stella Tranquilla has been republished with a different um, cover. Very intriguing. Here you see one of the um, sculptures Primo Levi made. On the new cover, we will see Primo, Primo Levi's head. And you see two hands of an artist creating the beard, making the beard, completing the beard of Primo Levi, which highlights the um, meta level within the graphic narrative. Scarnera is a former journalist who has always been interested in Primo Levi. And he wanted to discover, rediscover Primo Levi within uh, Turin, because they both are originally from Turin. 
at the beginning of the book, he thinks he will find traces, tangible traces of um, Levi, but at the end, again, spoiler alert, he will discover that we can only connect to Primo Levi via his books. In Masragostini's and Rangiashi's Levi, the volume on the right, which has been republished recently with a different cover and in colors. So this edition is in black and white, despite the colored cover. Um, we see Primo Levi uh, testifying in a classroom. And whereas the um, pupils in the class are confronted with a very um, controlled Levi, the reader is confronted with flashbacks. So we are inside uh, Primo Levi's head. And we see all the torture he has on the gun. We see all his doubts and questions, all the violence, which the young pupils in the class cannot see. Meanwhile, the book has been used in the classroom and young readers are confronted with that violence, but always under the guidance of a, of a teacher. The volume on the left seems to be an illustrated history of the Second World War and of the imprisonment of Levi. Just at the end, we will see Primo Levi standing in the classroom talking about uh, his number, his tattoo. And that number comes back in every volume. Now, within the Italian context, Becco Jalos uh, seems to have taken the lead in the publication of um, graphic novels accompanied by a broad paratext and those graphic narratives are there to raise awareness, to confront young readers with uh, difficult topics and a recent past. And within that same research, I started studying illustrated books for children on the lives of Liliana Segre, Segre and the sisters Bucci. Now, on the right, you see a uh, a graph, a graph, no, not a graphic novel, a comic book, Liliana e la sua Stellina, written by young pupils. So this is a class project, which has been presented by those same pupils with music and with images, but it stops much sooner than the story told in the illustrated books. So it stops at the deportation because the teacher decided that it was too hard for the pupils to draw stories on the camp itself. And while reading that book, you will discover that um, the settings were more related to the settings of the children than to the historical period in which the Holocaust uh, took place. I've been also studying um, different books written by Andra and Tatiana Bucci in collaboration with ghostwriters and the animation film, which is meant for very young um, watchers, but which has been criticized because we do see the violence in, and we do see the corpus, corpses in, in that animation film. As in, where is Anna Frank? The story is embedded in another story, um, we see a group of scholars in which one pupil is being, we see a group of young children in which one pupil is being bullied by the rest. And that bullying is being connected to the persecution of the Jews. So the discrimination of minorities or people who look different or have different beliefs. Now, while reading those books, I discovered another illustrated book in which art and memory sites are being integrated within the narrative. So the Holocaust is being narrated um, through art. And here we see the um, stumbling stones, Stol Stolpersteine or Pietre Dinciampo are being transformed into um, a message to the young readers. Whereas normally they sign here lifts um, that person who was then deported to that camp and maybe not survived uh, the journey. I even discovered a book for very young children in which we don't see characters, but objects. 
which typify the Nazis, the Jews, and other groups within society. It's a strategy advice, which we know from Mao's as well. And Natalia and I have been working on um, representation and the intermediality, the use of photos in Mendel's daughter and Palachinke. But I think I've used my time. I think I already talked too long. I'm awfully sorry. Once I start talking, I lose track of time and I cannot blame the different time zones for that. So within our research, we also want to exclude uh, belonging by Nora Krug. Because while using photos, um, authors evoke different senses. In Palachinke, at a certain point, point we will uh, smell pancakes, of course, in a figurative way. And it's almost time for lunch, so it might inspire you. But we also uh, feel things because texts seem to be layered. There's this illusion of layeredness within the text as there was an illusion of layeredness within runes and um, the arrival. So this is what I want to do in the future along with uh, Natalie and others. And this might be a very abrupt conclusion to my presentation, but I hope you picked my brain for a while, all my doubts and all the... Um, features, specificities I've discovered uh, during my journey. So thank you very much. And if there are any questions, feel free to ask them. I can I can never found the reaction button in time to, for, for okay. this, but, <laughs> but uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Inge, for, for the, for this, uh, uh, illuminating and, and very broad ranging talk and it's easy to um when you you know when you when you're working on something that is new and and that involves uh, a lot of material I, I understand that it's easy to lose track of time but i think we are well within the the uh you know the usual the, the time that that we have um so uh let me open up the uh, uh, the floor for questions and and uh, and discussion. I have some thoughts myself, but I'll let others come in first. I see uh, Miguel uh, Torres. Hi, Miguel. Good to see you. Good to or see you back. Virtual, sort of. Good see to you. see you back, Luca. I hope you you're ready to undertake all the tasks that you have to face now. I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Lancelot for a very very interesting. Um, a presentation. And I, I have to admit that I was very, very surprised to be faced with uh, my other side, which is the Latin American studies side. And therefore, I'm quite familiar with the, with the product of, um, of the, uh, in the field, I'm sorry, in the format, more than anything else. It was very interesting to see, um, the emphasis that Dr. Lancelot has placed on the migrant. I have a couple of um, doctorants in the Latin American studies who are very, very keen on using this type of material, but their focus is actually the narco narrative. If whatever, um, I don't know whether you're familiar with it, but this is all the literary production that is coming out of the narco traffic and so on, so popular in uh, Colombia, Mexico, and so on. But anyway, what I wanted to, um, to, to say is that um, I want to invite, thank you again, Dr. Lancelot, and I want to invite the department and uh, especially the graduate students who are so keen on some of these areas to guide us in the library in the acquisition of some of this material. It uh, We have providers who are very, very good at offering and so on, but I may not always be the best person to judge what it is that you would like you know, the faculty and the graduate students especially. So um, I invite you, I encourage you to request from me and 
uh, through the, uh, of course, through the library page and so on, best thing, suggest the title, but do um, request material because I am not an expert in this area and I would certainly appreciate to any any input from the department. Thank you. If, if I can jump in and I'll, I'll let Inga, um, you know, uh, respond, but if I can jump in just uh, to clarify, uh, uh, Miguel Torrens is uh, one of the librarians here at uh, uh, the University of Toronto, Roberts Library, and is also he's in, he's in charge of the. Um, and correct me if I'm if, if I don't say, if I have the proper vocabulary, uh, Miguel. But he's in charge of the Italian um, and the uh, the collection in Italian and in in the uh, uh, various uh, Spanish speaking cultures. Um, but and it's funny you should say that, uh, Miguel, because actually uh, this is for later. But I, I was going to contact you about about this, so you'll be getting an email from me, uh, possibly in the next few hours. But I mean, you do raise an important issue, right? That is the issue of accessibility of uh, uh, of this material. Um, I think even with graphics, it, it's interesting to me. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of material to think about, and I don't want to take more time than, than, I, uh, than I need to, and I certainly want to take time away from Inga. But on the one hand, you know, there's an increasing uh, legitimacy of uh, um, graphic novels as, or, or the, the graphic medium as a cultural medium on the same, on the same level as, not even genres, but you know, as prose or as visual, uh, as film narratives, as a way to explore a certain issue. I mean, University of Toronto Press is publishing graphic novels, including things like a an interpretation of the Latarillo de Tormes, uh, or the the something. Oh, one of uh, actually, it's a translation of Italian graphic novel um, on Thailand. I want to say. But anyway, the point here is that, you know, obviously, uh, graphic narratives is, are doing a lot, a lot these days, and um, are even used it to, you know, to express uh, uh, research in that would have you otherwise usually like uh, historical, sociological, critical research that it would have otherwise been. Uh, um, Expressed in, in in you know more traditional scholarly prose, so that's an interesting aspect. And, and I wonder, and this, here I finally get to what Inge, uh, some of the things Inge has been talking about. I wonder, I, I still wonder about that you know graphic novel versus comics conundrum. It's, and uh, I, I thought it was interesting that when you Inge, when you addressed it, to some extent you're pointing out the. How you know artificial and to some extent untenable it is because you can look at the characteristics of graphic novels and find them in comics, and vice versa. And I think it, there is this. I mean, this is it's a debate that has been going on probably you know for the last thirty years and um, ever since comics became a legitimate uh, object of study. And it seems to me that. Uh, Perhaps there is still this something that the field of comic studies hasn't quite dealt with, in spite of the fact that, as I say, now comics are doing everything that other uh, 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 media are are doing. Um, there is still this um, anxiety about legitimacy that the comics is still seen as a you know as as a bad word that the, the the word that is used to identify you know the x-men or topolino um whereas graphic novel is the the real uh, you know, the, the, the 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 serious stuff even though as far as i know i mean the, the first broad use of the word comics was in Marvel, uh, uh, the old word a graphic novel was by Marvel, the gra Marvel graphic novel, which they back to 1982. And I know because I was there and reading them and that dates me, but it's, it also dates the, the term, right? 
Um, so, you know, that, that, so that anxiety seems to be still there. And I think it's you know, one of the, it still is after all these years, something that comic studies need to finally come to term with uh, and, and, and perhaps so that they, perhaps they move on to do all the things that they can do. But anyway, so uh, I, I appreciated you that, that discussion there. Inga. Over to you. I'm, I'm done pontificating. Am I the only one who can't hear Inge? Inge, non ti sentiamo. No. Can you hear me now? Oh, perfetto. Sorry, I must have muted myself uh, uh, unwillingly, of course. Uh, I just want to come back to what Miguel uh, Torrance said. Um, I took quite a long detour to get to Italian graphic narratives, but I wanted to show that um, um, that it's very hard to st study at a national production we always turn to transnational productions. And while studying the representation of um, the crossing of the US-Mexican border, I got to understand better the representation of migration here in Europe. So that geographical distance helped me and also to analyze all types of um, graphic narratives, which I did not include in this um, presentation because I knew some of the scholars would have been present. Um, I, think, I think I saw... Uh, a specialist on the representation of Chinese uh, migration in, uh, in Italy. So I tried to present you a different corpus, but I hope the features and the devices might help you to to explore new narratives or to analyze all types of narratives. As for what uh, Luca said, it's an ongoing debate, unfortunately. I'm already convinced of the importance and the impact of comics and graphic novels, but others, and I often preach to the converted. I can easily persuade my students, but maybe my students don't always tell me what they think when they have to analyze graphic novels. But for, for others, that emancipation process of comics is still ongoing. And I'm so surprised in today's society in which we're always confronted with visual culture. So for me, it's a given. It's a fact that comics are important. But I do understand that people are still questioning the importance. But maybe that's good as well. It's a type of approach that and we, of course, can um, offer counter arguments uh, for that. But it might be interesting if that's an answer to your question. Maybe yes. we should organize a workshop on that and invite people who are very skeptical towards uh, the use of comics or the reading of comics in general. We could. We could do that. Actually, yeah, let's very... do that. Let's plan that. Yeah. No, but, uh, you know, I, I don't... You ask if you answer my question, yes and no. I, I, the no part is because I don't think it can really be easily uh, answered. So I'll, uh, it's, you know, it's one of those open debates, right? Um, but anyway, I don't want to just be... Uh, but just me my, 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 So I'll, I'll, I'll... Sorry, go ahead. No, it's just illustrative of other ongoing debates. Why are we still trying to define what a graphic novel or a comic book is? And the distinction, I think, is no longer there. But if you use a prototypical definition, you can work with it. And you can ask other people to define it or to uh, 
label a book, but I th don't think we will ever be able to distinguish graphic novels from comic books. And I don't think one is superior to the other. They're different and they address a different audience, but they are equally important in society. Any other comments? Oh, okay, Manuela, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Inge. Uh, since you mentioned audience, I was actually curious to... So these novels about migration and specifically the, the border between the US and Mexico, what's the target audience? More than like in the terms of age, like is this for adults, is it for like children or whatever? It's more like what's the the audience geographically? Like are they meant to just share this experience to, for example, raise awareness of what it really is like, the struggles and um or so basically my question is, do you think the audience targeted is more like people that don't know what's happening or is for people that know what it is like so it's just to give them voice and make them feel represented if i don't know if this makes sense it makes certainly sense manuelito um the one book i talked about which is available in spanish and english addresses a younger audience and it raises awareness um one of my colleagues was really disappointed while reading it because she didn't find anything new, but of course, she's a scholar in migration studies. So as would be expected, she didn't find anything new. But I think for young readers, it's very interesting. And I was interested in the devices used by the author. Most of the graphic novels, on the other hand, um, address an older audience and they address migration in different ways, in a direct way or an indirect way. In Tales uh, from La Vida, you have um, different authors who talk about migrations, others talk about the experiences in the US, about their lives in the US. It's kind of hard to study the reception of those graphic novels because you don't always have statistics or numbers. I've been looking for reviews on the internet, but even there you're not sure who writes them. So it's kind of hard to establish the faithfulness of the reviews. And I think graphic novels find their way to an audience already interested in the genre. And then when they ex want to explore migration, they can find these, uh, the corpus I presented to you uh, at the beginning of the presentation. I don't know whether that answers your question, but a lot of should be, uh, a lot of work still needs to be done on the reception of graphic novel as a lot of work still needs to be done on the collaborative authorship because a graphic novel or a comic book is marketed and branded in a certain way. And I think uh, publisher houses are, publishing houses are very important in that as well. Sometimes as a reader, you get disappointed or surprised by the, the, the narrative itself because the blurb text tells you something else. Thank you so much. Thank you, Inga. It's approaching 12.30. I just wanted, um, as it was just a comment in the uh, chat that we can, I can read just Juliana from Juliana Colalillo. I appreciate both the general overview of what graphic novels can do and the look at the two themes, namely the border and the Holocaust, especially its role in raising awareness for, uh, for younger, uh, for younger people. Um, I think we, uh, I, as I said, the 12, it's now 12.30, so or our time, 5.30, uh, 6.30, you are, <clears throat> for Inga, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> no, We're so, somewhere so in I between. think we can, yeah, we can uh, uh, wrap this up for today. Um, I'd like to uh, mention that we have another uh, tech talk, if that's uh, how we can uh, um, maybe branded uh, another conference in our series um, coming up on March second at on Thursday March second at four p.m. Uh, 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 Toronto time um, by um, Marco Arnaudo. Uh, the title is Comics and Games in Italy: The Quest for the Playable Story. So I hope that uh, you'll be there. More advertising will follow. 
But um, at this point, I would really like to thank uh, um, Inge for her uh, for her conference, for her uh, conference, for her lecture, for all, all the uh, uh, thoughts and ideas that she has uh, brought to our attention. And I also, you know, her suggestions for future um, for future work. I like your idea of some kind of discussion of. Uh, you know, what, what is a graphic novel? What is you know? I, it does it make sense to 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 make these distinctions and so on and so forth? So um, as with many of the things that we're doing, I think it's the beginning of a conversation. Uh, I was very glad and I'd like to thank again uh, that Inga could uh, be part of this conversation. I'd like to thank her again and thank you all for participating. And uh, hopefully, we'll see you soon in person or virtually. Thank That's you for thing. having me. And if you have other questions, please email me. Sounds good, Inga. Wow.